Welcome to the special episode of Movie Geeks United, where we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the film The Summer of 42 from 1971, released April 30th, 1971. And we're recording this April 20th, wow. 2021. Isn't that amazing? Uh, but just a mere a mere 50 years later. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. And yet here we are, or here you are. This is not my story. This is the story of you guys. I'm just a conduit who's uh, putting this together. But I am so fortunate that I'm able to do this because this film is, means so much to me and to so many other people. Uh, you know, just to give a few stats, statistics about this film, uh, shot on a budget of about a million dollars and it grossed $20 million domestically and 32.1 million internationally. And I want to make mention it was the fourth highest grossing film of its year, and it even outgrossed the James Bond film that was released that year, Diamonds That's Are right. Forever, <laughs> and, and Dirty Harry and Clockwork Orange. So, and those are considered iconic films. You guys beat those. So uh, that's no uh, small feat. Way so, to go, guys. I never even knew that. I didn't yes. know. No, I thought it was the $8 million budget. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was the only one they didn't pay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes. Um, so it was nominated for four Oscars. Obviously, uh, you guys know that. And it won for Michelle Legrand's wonderful score. And... Uh, you know, uh, Jennifer, you know, uh, Adam, Jennifer was telling me that, um, weren't you, Jennifer, that you got to present that Oscar to Michelle Legrand? I did. In, in those days, I was such a, a film snob. I had, this is my second film. I had just worked with John Wayne and uh, Rogers and Cowan, I think, were a PR firm at that time. When the film came out, uh, my agent said, if you hire them, they will guarantee that you will get a nomination for supporting Academy Award, supporting actress. And I was so silly. I said, oh, no, if they want to give that to me, they'll just give that to me. So, of course, I didn't hire them. I didn't get the supporting actress, but I did have the incredible honor of uh, handing Michel Legrand his, his Academy Award for that unbelievable piece of music, which I believe is uh, part and part, more than half of my performance was that music. Hmm. Because every time <laughs> Dorothy came on or the boys thought about this character, Dorothy, this incredible music came on. So I take no credit for any of it. I give it all to Michelle Legrand and he got the Academy Award and, as well as should have. Yes, it, it's such a wonderful score. It really is. And, you know, for, for years, and this has always been a pet peeve of mine, is the fact that when the soundtrack album was released in 1971, there's only two tracks on the album from the actual I film. Know. And the rest right. of it was from the Picasso Summer. So right. th Picasso Sweet, yes. Yes. It, yeah, that, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's and right. so it always annoyed me. And finally, that was rectified around 2016. They actually went back to the Warner Archives and found the original master tapes. And it has now been issued. So anybody who wants the original, it is out there now, wanted to make that clear that the complete. I didn't know story that. I didn't now, know that either. Yeah. Wow. Right. I have it. And it is wonderful. It is absolutely. Another, another, another piece of trivia on the music side. Uh, that was always an instrumental. And um, uh, uh, what, what was the guy that had no Bergman, on Alan it? Bergman. Huh? Marilyn, uh, Marilyn and no, Alan no, Bergman. No, he was uh, the horn guy that, that uh, did the instrumental and it was on number one on the charts forever. And oh, actually, right, right, right. Barbara Streisand put lyrics to it with somebody put lyrics and Barbara Streisand sang in it. It never did as well as the instrumental and the visuals and the people's right. memory of those moments with the boys on the beach and all that nostalgia. So that's a little tidbit of information. Yeah, that's good. That's, that's, that's an excellent tidbit of information. And it also, I wanted to mention that uh, going through trivia, because I had a few tidbits here, uh, that Peter Nero, the- uh, Peter uh, Nero, that's the guy. He's right. not a yeah. guy with a horn, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, Anyway, he, he had a uh, top 40 single with it. It peaked at number 21 in December of 71 on the That's Billboard right. chart. So, yes, yeah, so I wanted to mention that. That is worth as an, noting. As an instrumental. As yeah, an, as an instrumental. Yeah. yeah, at a time when instrumental records still actually charted, which is non-existent today, sadly. 
Uh, right. But <laughs> anyway, uh, so we'll move on uh, with uh, a few pieces of trivia, as I just mentioned. And uh, of course, uh, it was filmed, and you guys will get into this later, uh, because of it supposedly takes place on Nant in Nantucket, but they felt it was too modern looking for uh, the film when they actually were going to shoot it. And so that's why they made the decision to go to uh, Montecito, which you guys will talk about uh, in a little bit. Men yeah, actually, Mendocino, not Mendocino. Montecino. I'm sorry. Montecino's near Santa Barbara. Mendocino, yes, absolutely. Mispronunciations. Um, but Which is where they also shot the Russians are coming. Yes, uh, yes. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, before we were there, they shot the Russians are coming in uh, Mendocino. Yes, in fact, that brings me to uh, a note that I wanted to share with you guys from uh Albert Brenner, which I've shared this with you previously, Jerry, but I'll share it with Jennifer and Oliver as well. Uh, he, uh, I had asked him just a couple of questions. Obviously, he was, the, like I said, the production designer, and he chose the, uh, the location. And uh, anyway, Albert had everything to uh, do with determining the shooting locations, his wife tells me, along with Robert Mulligan, of course. They did have a little help from knowing the locations used by the Russians are coming, which had just finished shooting. Albert built the house, taking into consideration that it was supposed to be the East Coast and not the West Coast. You shouldn't, you could not shoot the sun going down, for instance, so angles were important. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and they started with the house aged 20 to 25 years and then had to turn it into a new house over the course of a lunch break. Uh, during the changing of the back porch, a grip found a $10 gold piece in the dirt. Albert and Robert Mulligan had a very good relationship. They talked all the time about what and how, and they enjoyed each other's company. Albert also had a great relationship with Bob Surtees, who shot the film. He was charming old. And old oh, best DP in the world. I'm a big fan of his work, I must say. Um, the best. Yeah, you mentioned it. I, I hate to interrupt the, the no, letter, but you mentioned, no, you just mentioned that it had been nominated for four Academy Awards. I think one of them was for cinematography, wasn't it? It was, yes, and the uh, editing as well. Uh, and right. yeah. that's great DP as well. A, a, little, a little information about Bob Surtees. When I was 22, when I was the older woman, in some of the 22. <laughs> yeah, so they think I'm 110 by now. Um, but <laughs> you don't look any uh, different. <laughs> but Bob Surtees actually sat me down and I had uh I knew light pretty well. And he said, I'm gonna take your key light and I want to apologize to you that I'm not shooting you as beautifully as I would like to as a, a leading lady, but I'm just in keeping with the storyline, the sadness, the loss, and so forth. And he oh. said, but may I just tell you this, a key light is the main light that you have. And he said, I'm going to move in increments, five degree increments across the room, your key light. And as I do so, I'm going to show you this on, on film and you're going to age five years with every five degrees. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> it's true. Wow. Wonderful, wonderful. So, you know, talk about tidbits of wisdom way, way early on. That's great. Yeah. That's fantastic. I'm That's loving this. I'm learning things. I mean, this is 50 years later when I thought I knew everything about this movie. And I'm finding all these new things about it. I love it. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, I, this was a, and um, Albert is now 95. So he's 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 uh, I was going to actually try to get him on with us, but he's his hearing is gone, unfortunately. And so that's oh. why we were not able to. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's fortunately still with us at least. So, but he said that um, Surtees was terrific. And uh, the, another piece of trivia is that when not working, Surtees was out on his own taking pictures with his 35 millimeter camera, and that uh, he was able to uh, in, in a, he was able to deal with the sun going the wrong way, and was able to devise a crane which they did not have from equipment they had. Uh, from a previous film that he had shot. So wow, uh, kind of made it up on the, the spot. So anyway, I thought that was all interesting um, and was hoping it was something you guys might not know. I um, did not know that. Yes. So um, yeah. the other thing that I wanted to share with you guys was that Lou Frizzell, uh, who played the druggist in the film, obviously uh, he's not with us sadly, but I wanted to make sure we represented him in spirit uh, somehow. Uh, 
because he was a busy, uh, very busy character actor in the, in the 1970s and sadly died uh, very young at uh, the age of 59 in June of 1979. Uh, I located his uh, uh, a cousin, first cousin actually, who is now a psychiatrist in uh, Fresno. His name is uh, Channing Hitchcock. And he tells me that uh, Lou was his second cousin and died in 1979, age uh, 59. He was a professional actor since the end of World War II. He graduated from UCLA in 1942 and taught drama in Manzanar Japanese in internment camp. There he became friends with Ansel oh. Adams, the uh, the painter. Uh, Ansel was doing work in photographer. the Sierras. Uh, yes, photographer. I'm sorry. He says painter here, but but I think, yeah, that's that's correct. Ansel was doing work in Sierras at the time, Lone Pine area. Also the home of Alabama Hills, uh, the main film location for thousands of films, mostly Westerns. I personally spent time there as a high Sierra Packer going to Mount Whitney. Lou, or Bud as we called him, went to New York and spent time off Broadway in the early 60s. He moved to LA and spent the rest of his career acting in various TV and movie films. He was a very easygoing, simple kind of guy, very talented musically. His dad lived to be 96. His mother died also of cancer at 60 also genetic, I guess. Um, so anyway, just a little bit of information about Lou there um, that I received from his... Uh, uh, that's great to hear. You know, all the, the there's so few characters in the movie, really, that each right. one is kind of special and, and unique and stands out. Yes. I think everyone, uh, Jerry, was handpicked by Mulligan. Every, everybody from uh, the prop master who was always crying when I was doing that last scene, he'd come in and I'd have to be left alone. And he'd come in with this 70 year old man with tears yeah. flowing down his face. And I was out of tears at that, at that point. But I, I think when you talk about Ansel, um, I, I thought that Surtees got a look in the 35 millimeter that was very Wyeth, the painter. Yeah, right. um, yes, right. There is nothing like 35 millimeter, I'm telling you. They were just such artists. You know, it's interesting you say that because um, I remember at the time, because I didn't know uh, at the time even who Andrew Wyeth was. And I remember at the time they were talking about looking at, oh, you know, where, where Hermie is walking off to your house uh, at the end before he gets to you. He's, and there's this whole, I'm, I'm yelling something at him. There's this whole field of of you know whatever the field was of weeds out there right. and the ocean in the background and they and I remember them talking about it having a look of an Andrew Wyeth painting. Absolutely. Interesting that you would say that now because at the time I didn't even know who he was. It was and, the tones and the fence in the sand and very mm -hmm. Wyeth and yes, the flowers. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Well, this is the kind I of stuff. I'll that... back again for my next movie. <laughs> <laughs> well uh so anyway i want to share the the letter from herman and then we'll just let you and from there we'll just let you guys go on and share your memories uh and we'll not belabor the point but uh anyway this is the letter that we have from herman and it says uh, this is herman, herman now you're talking i don't know if we mentioned this ahead of time because i oh. know we were discussing beforehand but you're talking about herman rauscher the writer of right the movie, yes right? I was gonna... but Mulli it's mulligan's voice yes Robert right mulligan did That's the narration right. He that did it. He did that. That's right. Yes. Yeah. But uh, yes, I was going to I was going to uh, clarify that as well, but I'm glad you did. So thanks. Um, this is uh, so this comes from Herman Rauscher, the Oscar nominated screenwriter from the uh, from the film. Uh, he says, this is Herman Rauscher calling from the wilds of Connecticut to remind you out there that it's been 50 years since your little film grew legs and happily shocked the powers that be at Warner Brothers <laughs> with its success. Mm -hmm. 50 years. You've lost a few members since then. Bob Mulligan, Richard Roth, Lou Frizzell, and Gary. Grimes seems to be a wall somewhere, but for the most part, you're all still intact. I am still intact, too. Often thinking back to the time when Bob took a fragile screenplay, three young teenage boys, a beautiful actress who had appeared in but one film thus far, and came up with an offering that has snuggled into the memories of moviegoers wherever popcorn grows. Rounding out the cast was a handful of gifted teenagers, a California location that looked like New England, and a stack of reviews that read as though my mother wrote them. These many, <laughs> <laughs> these many years later, on behalf of those who couldn't be with you today, this grateful writer thanks you for being born 
and invite you to jump in and tell us how the summer of 42 has affected your lives, what you're doing presently, and if it were possible, would you do it again? That's it from here. God bless, and you're on. So there we go. You know, I, have to, I have to clarify that now. I thought you were talking about the letter from the character Hermie, who was... Oh, um, oh, oh that, that you read. So that you that, read that is now the modern day Herman Rauscher. That, that is. That, that's writing to us. That's very, very special. Very handsome letter. Yeah, yes. sweet. As yeah, of yesterday, he, he, he sent this to me. So, uh, so yeah, he, Herman, Herman's a great guy. I've been in touch with him like over the years. I was back in New York many years ago oh. and uh, called him up and, and said, Hi, it's Jerry Hauser. And he was really great. And went, oh my gosh, Jerry, hi. And he was so sweet. You know, come by, come by. And, and um, we went by and, and uh, took us out to dinner, he and his wife. And um, yeah, he was, he was very appreciative to all of us. He was really gracious that way in his appreciation for how the, the movie turned out, you know, and, and, uh, and forever grateful because I remember at the time, I believe, and, and forgive me, Herman, when you see this, if I'm, if I'm misrepresenting it, but I think they needed, it was a small movie, as you said, a really low budget. And uh, they needed a rewrite for the script at the time. And they didn't have any money for the rewrite. And I believe Richard and um, Bob Mulligan gave him X number of points on the movie in order for him to do the rewrite, which in turn, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, helped. it was worth it, Herman. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Good, See, good what, what's interesting is that we, I don't know about you, but I work for scale on it. And as um, did I. And, and, and as did everybody. And I remember having a, uh, well, it was such a phenomenal script uh, that you just wanted to be in it and it didn't matter. But Richard Roth years later took me out to lunch at the Beverly Hills Hotel at the back where the pool was and all of that. Right. And he said, I just have to tell you, uh, Jennifer, that I never have to work again in my life. And I'm so grateful for yours and everyone else's performance. And I said, that's fine. You can give me a point. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Lu Lu Lucas did it. Why not you? Well, well, you know what was so gracious about Mulligan with that is that uh, we all wanted to be there. The, the crew on the last day of shooting came to see the rushes, which is never done. When a crew is finished with a movie, they're tired, they wanna go home. The entire crew show up, showed up to see the rushes, which is what you shot the day before. And, um, and I think that Mulligan made a assertive effort to uh, call us all out by putting our names at the end of the movie. Mm -hmm. That and was really cool. That was something that was extremely um, special. Actually, it was my third movie. I, I did a movie called uh, The Love of Ivy, and um, I was sent a telegram by the director, I'm blank on his name, I can't hear and I can't think anymore, but um, Sidney Portier. I had one line in that movie, and I received a telegram way back when, in 70, 69, 70, thanking me for being in his movie. Mm -hmm. Had nothing to do with me. He sent everybody on the set, the crew, everybody, a telegram. Oh. How uh, classic, really beautiful. Oh, that's, that's great. Cool. Yeah, very thoughtful, very nice. Yeah. Um, well, uh, so if you guys just want to uh, tell us, each one of each one of you want to tell um, us a little bit about your life's journey leading up to summer forty two. Uh, if, if you want to do that and how you wound up um, getting cast, if if that's uh, okay with you guys. Who wants to go you know first? what the couch is? No. <laughs> <laughs> you did uh, not ahead, need that, I that's for sure. If you tell me yours. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in. Um, okay. You were a Marxist. I believe you were a Marxist rebel, weren't you? Uh, <laughs> I, I was. I, 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 I was <laughs> Oliver. I was. I was trying to be all, all kinds of things that, that had to do with the year in which the, the, the film was made. After all, it, it was 71 and the high tide of um, uh, a certain kind of uh, leftism. 
um, I was the child of academic parents, um, and I, I didn't find anything in school that uh, seemed like something I would really want to be doing in life until uh, at Dalton, there was the theater department and a very good acting teacher, and Dalton being Dalton, uh, it was a connected parent body, and somebody knew that Mulligan was in town looking for Boys for the for the film, and I remember I I, I was in an anti-war demonstration, um, in 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 my anti-war paint, which consisted of an old um, long Polish-looking uh, uh, army coat and um, buttons, and you know my which uh, my which very long which I have coat. to say you wore all the time while we were there, and I love the fact that you were doing that because you were fourteen. <laughs> in this anti-war demonstration. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, anyway, I, I deviated from the line of March and I, up into, was it 666, the thing that, um, where was Warner Brothers? Uh, just off Fifth there. Um, anyway, it was a big building. And um, I, think, I think Bob saw me under all the war, war paint. You know? He saw Benjamin right away. Um, don't know how. Um, but he didn't. And the screen test was really a formality. Um, Bob, you know, Bob had a great eye, uh, eye for that. Obviously, he did, he did To Kill a Mockingbird and worked with the kids in that movie. Yeah. And, uh, and obviously, he's, it's, it's really cool that he saw through you because you were nothing like you. I think of as far as you being, you know, anti-war and in your in your right, 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 right. and the one the one thing I, I'm you know I am sort of proud of is that, that I really did do a job of work and it was yeah you did uh, you know uh, because uh, you know at 14 when, when things of 14 year olds as as you know while well, you're 14 you're 14 but no there are different periods and times one's being 14 is very different um, and um, uh, you know I I, I I did. I didn't hide what what I my my hopes and ambitions to, uh, with Bob. You know, when I would talk to him about Jean Luc Godard. I mean, I must have been insufferable. <laughs> and and yet, you know, the the film I've, I've always thought is in some ways like a small French film of the new, new, Nouvelle Vague, um, and it was part of a new kind of way of making films in Hollywood. Um, it had that small personal French uh, quality. And I believe it's done extremely well in, in, in France and, and, and overseas. Um, but uh, my parents were, were concerned, you know, I mean, here I was disappearing into seemingly into, into Hollywood or something. And, and, and Bob reassured them in the following manner. He said, don't worry. None of my child actors have ever amounted to anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. I'm glad I heard that part. That is so cool. <laughs> Sorry, I missed part of your story. <laughs> That's, That's great. You did, I mean, you, I think, to be honest, I think as far as who we, the three of us were, the three kids were, um, you stretched the furthest because <laughs> you're, you did because you were not that little, no. that kind of innocent kid, you know, of the three of us. You were the least of that. I mean, my character, I felt was, I mean, I think that's what Bob saw in, in us yes. is that it was, it was kind of me. And I think Gary's character, knowing Gary and, and Jennifer, you knew him well that way too, but he was very much that way. You know, quieter yeah. and the more sensitive one, and more the, sensitive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you actually stretch the furthest as far as you know acting. <laughs> we just walked in there. I just walked in there being me. <laughs> Whatever. Well, that I, was. I didn't actually know you guys very well because remember Jerry uh, Bob Mulligan as the director had a notion which I think worked well for the film, since we all were pretty new actors and especially you guys, um, that he kept us apart 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wanted to maintain an aura of mystique about Dorothy's character. Uh, I, of course, ate peanut butter sandwiches and, and um, adopted two cats during that movie because <laughs> I wasn't allowed to be with anybody. Uh, but it, it was very interesting because there was, I, I really didn't know what you guys were going through. You <laughs> were just coming off the page. As I read it and you created your character, that's who you were and that's who we were. And we yep. never got to kind of hang out and have hamburgers or right anything like that so that that part was interesting it's interesting to hear that 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 you try uh stretch that far oliver yeah. well i may have stretched but but uh that um bob gave bob finally gave me the, this hat that he wore all the time he, he gave it to me and on the brim he'd written oliver you were benji right so that's great, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> you were you did it you know Jennifer, you mentioning that about keeping us apart to the point where even with the hotel, I forget where you were staying, but we stayed at this hotel there or this motel actually right. in Fort Bragg, California. Right. And we were down at one end to the point that he kept us apart that we were down at one end of this hotel. And if you were at the hotel, you were at the far end of the hotel. Yes, I was we, in the motel. <laughs> we weren't at the motel. Yeah. I was at the motel. Oh, you were. You wouldn't have known it because you were at the far end. But we and... didn't even eat lunch together. You know, when you have a right. break or you have right. a break. So he, was, he was really adamant about that. And I think we all respected it. And I think it worked it was, well. I think, thinking but back. It, was, it left us not knowing each other. Yes. Exactly. Well, other, than the, other than the characters we were playing. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, the... A, a, a perfect example of that, the feeling that, that I remember I had, and I guess, I don't know, um, you know, Oliver can chime in if he felt the same way, but that opening shot in the movie where we, we come up over the clip and we're watching you over with your husband, you know, over by your, your house, that was sort of the feeling because every once in a while when we weren't working, we'd like catch a glimpse of you. <laughs> and it was i mean we were younger number one you were incredible yeah. as you still are incredibly gorgeous and this untouchable person and it was just whoa there she is i remember that i thought i thought that was really pretty brilliant of of bob mulligan um my my story about getting this role and then i want to hear yours jerry but mine was that i i had been working since i was 15 to buy a horse and have recycled all those dreams and doing equine therapy for the military right now, et cetera. But um, so I had been working since 15. I was doing cover girl. I studied acting in New York Playhouse. I was married at 17 and I had a two year old daughter. Mm. And when the call came in to read for this role, they were only looking at 30 year olds. And at that point I was oh, really? 19, 22. Yeah. And I remember my agent really doing a good job, Jerry Steiner saying, there's a huge difference between uh, boys that are 16, playing 16, 17, 15, around there, and um, someone who is a mother of a, of a two-year-old. And so he got me in to see and read for it. And I didn't get the job right away at all. I had to test for it. Yeah. and. Um, <laughs> I remember calling Jerry and they, they asked me to come in and test. And there was that looming scene in my mind because times were different, Jerry, we've talked about this. Times were so different in those days. Mm -hmm. And there was the bed scene. Um, and that's why I was laughing about the couch because uh, there was none of that. It was at that time that movies were coming out and they started to do nude scenes. They had never done it before. They'd done it in Europe, but they had never done it before. And because it was a bed scene and a first love scene, um, I remember calling my agent and saying, could you just tell me how Mr. Mulligan is going to handle that scene? Yeah. And he said, why? And I said, well, <laughs> because there's a new trend and it's a bedroom scene. And I just want to, I don't want to waste their time. I'm not going to do a nude scene. It's just how I feel about it, nothing wrong with it, back or forth. And he said, this is Robert Mulligan you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Kill a mockingbird, <laughs> porno thing. And I said, no, 
but I insisted because I said I don't want to waste their time and and um, test for the role and get it and not be able to do what, whatever it is that he wanted me to do. And as it turned out, um, his answer was, if she's the right one, we'll work around it. <laughs> so <laughs> for years, uh, I've done yeah. 40 movies. And for years, people came up to me and said, don't tell me you've never done a nude scene because they try and have me do it again. And I said, no, if you, if you watch very carefully, it was beautifully done. And, um, and I, I, Jerry, you and I were talking about that the other day. I think that it was a caveat. It was something lovely in that movie that uh, was representative. There was nothing lascivious about Summer of 42. It was delightful and charming. And I've always been honored beyond words to have been a part of it. Um, the romance, the, the, the the, the nuances, everything about it. Um, so there were pictures out there like Mrs. Robinson or whatever that was called. Um, uh, the graduate. The graduate that, that had a different tone. This, this tone was um, something that I can't argue with. And I have thoughts that maybe later we'll talk about of whether I would do it again. Certainly not at 73, but- um, <laughs> You look the same. the older woman then. Um, but but it, there, I, I found, my job in that, in that capacity as an actress was to make Dorothy as vulnerable and likable as possible so that you could understand the moment. I've always said this, if Hermie had come to the, the cottage or her place 10 minutes later or 10 yeah, minutes yeah, earlier, yeah, or yeah. there's a little alcohol involved as well, because I remember they had the bottle of wine there it wouldn't have happened it right. wasn't that mm -hmm. kind of movie right it was just the moment the loss the humanity of having someone uh to hold and be held and um in that in that regard i i just thought it was so beautifully done yeah yeah you're absolutely right you know what you said too about there was no lasciviousness to it i think that's what also allowed it to be more acceptable that you really did get caught up in the moment of where and how yeah. it happened. Yeah. And there was nothing exploitive about no, it, it you know, the way he shot it. No. It was not exploitive at all. No, no, not at all. And it, and it had a romance to it. And um, I, I didn't have my faith at that time. I'm a Christian now. And so people have asked me over the years, what do you think about that? Would I, would I, say that anybody at 15 or 16 should outside of marriage be doing that no but it's the human heartbeat mm -hmm. that will always exist it was the it's so it was the brilliance of the film i thought it was humor it was um romantic it was uh, everybody got to live out in their fantasy in this movie what they were thinking in their own mind and i think the character dorothy um, the, the, the next morning, I don't think she was a happy camper, but I think uh, in, in the heat of the moment, not the heat, the heat, but in the softness of the moment mm -hmm. and the vulnerability of the moment, uh, I've never, ever been sorry about making that movie. Yeah. It's, it's interesting too, just how, you know, how things work out. I mean, your feeling about doing a nude scene and then not doing it. You yeah. know, I don't know. I don't know whether or not I have I've never heard whether or not he approached you about doing it that way or not. But regardless, how it just all worked so well I, together. I think it, it it helped it helped the uh, the scene personally. But that wasn't why I said I just wanted them to know that I was not going to do that. And he worked around it beautifully as he was just a brilliant director. Just yeah. Absolutely. I remember, I remember before that scene happened, I, I'll never forget this, that for some reason, because I was so into the character and she was so sad and uh, Surtees had his five degree <laughs> light over here to make me look like my stuff. And I was crying and for some reason, I, I was barefoot. I remember what I was wearing in the scene. I had a white skirt on and a blue sweater and I was going to the kitchen before Hermie arrived, probably to get some wine. And I was walking across the room and I was so involved. 
And Mulligan said, cut. And he quietly came over to me and he said, you have to walk on your whole foot, not just on your toes. And I walked across that scene on my toes. Wow. <laughs> That's how I was just, and he, he said, I'm sure you're not aware that you're walking on your toes That's great. That's across great. the world. It's why you need a director. I mean, you know, it's why I'm one, sorry? it's why actors need a director. Yes, uh, yes. You know what I mean, ballerinaing around. <laughs> <laughs> towing through Macbeth or whatever, it's not good. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. You, by the way, you know, were really wonderful in that too. I mean, coming off of you being uh, the it, Claire All, right? Was that yours? Claire All, all those years? Cover no. Girl. I knew it started with a C, but being the. No Claire All for me, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you doing that and allowing yourself to be the way you were in that and so vulnerable and crying and just that way that was yeah. brave of you you know i mean just to yeah, it's scary but i felt well taken care of as well that's the beauty of a, a great director is to yeah. have his actors feel safe and and uh I, I remember the shot i remember he allowed me to go to all the rushes. I've, I've always been to all the rushes in, of all the films. I just learned that way. A lot of people can't go to the rushes. They get too self-conscious. And I remember seeing the dancing scene with, with uh, Gary Grimes and he came around in the camera and this tear came down. He wasn't supposed to be crying. Yeah, no, he crying. was great. And he just went, what? Yo, hello. Oh, this is so beautiful. Right, yeah. Very, yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's why it was not lascivious. It was so sweet. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very honest, yeah. you know, for that moment. You what know, were my- you doing before, Jerry? Before uh, you, I wasn't cool. in the business at all. Really? And no, not at all. And I was going to high school. I think I was the oldest of the three of us because I was 17 when I got up there. I remember I turned 18 while we were doing the movie because I had to register for the draft up in, uh, <laughs> in the casino. Um, but I was going to high school and I was in, I was in a drama class, but I was yeah, a little, a little chubbier, a little shy, whatever it was I was working, you know, I, I was interested in acting, but I was working backstage and doing that kind of stuff in this drama class. And um, a casting director, came around to North Hollywood High School where I was going to high school, Nessa Himes, who was a casting director at uh, Warner Brothers, looking for kids. They looked in New York, they saw hundreds of boys um, wow, in New York and then came out to LA and they were looking there and she came to the high school. I remember standing in front of our drama class, you know, just kind of looking at everyone and asked me and one other kid if we'd come outside. Oh, and we wow. did. I wasn't involved in the business at all. And <clears throat> asked if we'd be interested in coming in to meet the director and producer for a movie over at Warner Brothers. You know, and I'm there going, you know, yeah, sure, that'd be great. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> what did I know? But it, I'd never even been on a movie lot. And <laughs> I remember the next day, this is 1970, you know, I put on my, my, my coolest bell bottoms and my nicest <laughs> hips. And, uh, you know, went over there and met with Richard Roth and Robert Mulligan. Uh, and I remember, you know, how different people touch your lives sometimes, the secretary, and I think her name was Liz, but I'm not sure. Um, she was sitting out there and I was nervous waiting to go in because there were other kids that were going in there, you know, and, I'm, and she's talking to me and said, how do you feel this, that? And I went, ah, kind of nervous. And she went, you know what? just you know i'm not quite sure what to do she said just go and just be yourself when you go in there so i tried to do that you know which obviously is what they were looking for yeah, you were great you know well i mean i think i well, think the fact that you could do that though be that flamboyant in in a sense you were you 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 I, were a nut <laughs> i guess i mean you don't you have no idea remember you we just, left you there you didn't take the air out of the room you made the room oh very sweet of you to say 
Um, but I remember we went out and we went out on the back Western lot where they used to shoot gun smoke because I'd never been on a movie lot before. We were running around there. I mean, it was just all right. this magical Hollywood kind of thing. Anyway, a couple of weeks later, they had called me up and asked if I'd um, uh, come in and do a screen test. So we did the, um, which I did, I cut my hair. It, at the time it was long, at least I felt it was long and I felt really cool because it was long. And I was graduating from high school and I had to graduate with like my hair this length, you know, which was horrible <laughs> at the time. But uh, yeah, I cut it right before, right before graduation and went and did the screen test with Gary Grimes. And we did the scene where we're in the, in the um, upstairs in the bedroom taking notes on, on what you do, you know, the different steps. Uh, and we did that scene. And then they called back a number of, uh, of the, a couple of weeks later and asked if I uh, want to do the movie. Wow. So it was, yeah. Your life was, changed. Boom. Life, like, you know, yeah, life changing. And I, I know a lot of people have life changing experiences, but talk about sending your life in the direction it ultimately went right. which was into acting uh, uh you know it changed my life you know which is and, and I, I obviously it affected all of our, our lives i think so that way which is why there's this i mean it's interesting there's this closeness at least i feel it between all of us sharing this thing together i mean we're bonded together you know and <laughs> woven into each other's lives because of this movie and i mean i rarely see either of you yet i see you know it's like hey i, I, I haven't seen i haven't seen oliver for probably i don't know 20 years or 30 years and he came out to la because there was an event that that he came out for and who knows what went on in his life during that time? And here he comes up. I remember him from then and we're connected from them. And I'm going, hey, I, he came in, he was wearing a jacket. He had these patches on his elbows. He came out, he was just very staid. You know, the, hey, how you doing, man? How you... <laughs> <laughs> you were right back where you were. Absolutely. Oh, yes. and, it, and it feels that way now, you know, with both of you. I love it. Yes. That's you awesome. Too. That's great. I, I I really I'm so enjoying hearing your stories, and this is just fantastic. I appreciate you guys sharing all of this. It's uh, it's it's interesting to me not having been there to hear these. So uh, obviously, um, but yeah, I I, I I guess we can move on to the second question, and that uh, would be, you know, what are some production stories when you were actually in the thick of it uh, that are have stood out in your mind all these years? Uh, if you have any to share, that would be. Well, we touched on we touched on the fact that they kept us apart from right from Jennifer right you know, which is interesting. Jennifer, you talked about your uh, experience ended up with what you said two cats and uh, something around because you were alone the whole time. Not with two cats and something else. You 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 kept yourself busy. It was yeah. Well, I. One thing I do remember also about this the, this group, and it, it's kind of off to the right, but um, my mom had a, a car accident while we were shooting, mm. and she broke her back. And wow. I remember asking if I could go home to surprise her, and they let me go home. That doesn't yeah. happen. They yeah. don't. They don't. Yeah. You when you're in almost every scene. So I remember flying out of Fort, whatever it was, and Prague. the mountain, yeah, and um, through the woods to grandmother's house. And I, I went, <laughs> I got home and, uh, and surprised her and got back, I think in two days and was exhausted. But that, that, that was uh, just very heart, heartwarming to me that they allowed me to do that. And then I took my cats home. One of the cats was in a driver's uh, engine and they turned the engine on. So that was Oscar. <laughs> My parents' names were Oscar and Rennie. So the cats' names were Oscar and Rennie. Well, that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I had them for 20 years after that. That's great. Yeah, I remember, you know, uh, it was because it was my first film i mean i had no idea this was a whole i'm a kid from the you know the san fernando valley at this point having right. no experience i mean at least 
you know, Oliver, you grew up in New York, you know, I'm in the Valley in LA, <laughs> which was, which was just very sleepy. And mm. all of a sudden, I mean, my eyes were, were open. I had this incredible experience over the summer. We did it during the summer back in 1970. Mm -hmm. I remember I graduated from high school and two weeks later, I went up to Mendocino in Northern California to do the movie. And right. Talk about your life, you know, opening up to the stuff you've never even knew about or heard yeah. of and people treating you. I mean, they, they treated us like kids, but still yeah. treated us. The, 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 makeup, the makeup man would, would hold my face in his hands. And he said, <laughs> beautyage. <laughs> beautyage. I was beautyage. I, I love you remember that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was, I mean, for me, it was, it was just all so magical and amazing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, watching them build, watching them build Jen's house, you know, Dorothy's house, which wasn't there. Everything in Mendocino, when we were in the town, all of that was there. Other than the movie theater, the movie theater was a gas station where um, uh, right. you go in to see the movie. And they, but I was, it was fascinating. Yeah, they were framing Mendocino, e even though a lot of it was, you know, pre-existing. Um, they, they did do a lot of fairly careful framing, and I was interested in that. Um, I think, I think part of the part of the the appeal or interest of the film, at least overseas, must have been. All right, so here's the summer of '42. '42 was a dreadful year. <laughs> right especially in europe yeah yeah and and here here is an american scene um that can't hear i'm sorry some ways so far removed and in some ways you know uh right yeah just because jennifer wasn't able to hear you there he was just saying how in europe how they must have interpreted this movie because what was going on in Europe in 1942 compared to this scene in the United States yes. in 1942 and yes. how it must have must have affected them. Yeah, that's a good point. I never thought about that. We were, we were shooting in the 70s and then they, they were talking about the 40s and we had all these generations. My dad was a war hero and uh, there's something that so resonated with me, um, of course, Vietnam was going on, and it was it was it was a crazy uh, grouping of, of of generations and times that that yeah. that was really interesting. I had a uh, not during the shooting, but I had a fascinating experience about five years ago on the forty fifth anniversary. Somebody contacted me from Mendocino from the film board there saying that they were going to have a, um, uh, they were going to honor the movie there for the 45th anniversary and ask if I'd like to come up there. And so I went and I hadn't been since we did the movie. And it was, it was really, really, it was moving and bizarre in uh -huh. that you go back to Mendocino. Mendocino is a national landmark. They have it as a national landmark. The town, I'm telling you, is exactly the same as when it we is. did the movie. It is. I, you know? I revisited. Did you? I did. I had to go back and see it. I can't remember when I did. It wasn't over any occasion, but I was stunned to see that I was just walking into the past. Um, and just just on the, on the production side, uh, I, I want to make a note that they don't do any more, but Mulligan did. And he took the, uh, Bob Surtees, the, uh, cinematographer and the actors and took a week before we started to shoot with no crew there and just rehearsed in the locations right. which right. ultimately saved so much time yes working out the kinks of the scene and and all of that uh it's i've done it when i direct and it's really it really makes a difference uh and the, and the crew was small but hand-picked and super professional so and very caring yeah. So and all of that together um, with 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 Bob's expertise, and of course her uh, Herman was on the set all the time, right? Around right. making notes, 
being able to massage the dialogue and, and do what he needed to do to make it special. Mm. Yeah, and that dialogue, you know, as far as I, for me, was all in the script. You know, a lot of times, you know, in other films I've done, you know, you have a lot of leeway and they let you add lib things and add a lot and this and that. And it's not that Bob didn't let us add no. if he wanted to, but there was no need to. No. And, you know, because of, of Herman's writing and right, just so spot on. But, and you remember one other thing, one other thing was that in those days, uh, the way the, the movie, movies were made, you wanted to have a book out and get it on the bestseller, best New York Times bestseller list. And so it had some cachet before it went right. into the theater. Well, <laughs> there was Hermie, Herman writing away the no. novel, madly trying to get it done because we had already finished <laughs> the script <laughs> and pressing it on through. And it did hit the, the New York Times top seller and uh, and they ran with it, but it was in the reverse. So yeah, yeah, yeah. he worked I didn't, hard. I didn't remember that at all. That's great. Well, he novelized the, the screenplay, yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah. He novelized the screenplay. Yeah, yeah. 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 It, um, you know, the area up there, I remember too, there were a couple of things they did a lot with, with, um, with wireless microphones at yes. the time up there. And yes. I remember it was just, it made them crazy because I guess there's a heavy, there was a heavy metal content in the sand on the beach, but they, these just little bits of memories I have, they were always having trouble with that. In my ear. <laughs> I think I have the sand in my ear. <laughs> anyway, they're always having trouble with that. They they interchange because of uh, being at the beach and being foggy a lot of the time. They went yeah. from real fog to using fog filters to to match different scenes. Um, yeah, I just you know my memories of it are all really wide eyed. Yes, and it was an eight feet shoot which was on the shorter side. Now they make movies in five weeks and four weeks. And um, the, only, the only better time I ever had on a set was working um, in Europe. And um, I, I, that, that the, it was Visconti's last film and it was called, uh, he did films like Death in Venice and so forth. Yeah. And he had had a, a heart attack. And um, so he only could work five, five hours a day, but it was a denuncio uh, play from the 1600s. So it took us five, five hours to get ready and five hours to shoot. And wow. everyone spoke a different language. <laughs> John Wayne in the movie that I did with John Wayne, who was a delight by the way, bigger than life, everything that I was such a brat. I wanted to work with Al Pacino. I wanted to work with the actors and it was John Wayne. And I have, I've just always loved having the opportunity to work with him. And he was such a pro, he was on, on the set on time and he would work with the young actors. And he told me uh, one time, which really came in handy when I did this European film, he said, you know the scene, we know what we're gonna say, but a good actor, listens to it like it's the first time every time you just don't know what's coming out well that held me in good stead in europe when i was working with giancarlo Giannini, and he was speaking italian i was speaking english someone else <laughs> was speaking french and mm. we really had to listen to what was going on uh to act the scene out and then they dub it and the and the dubbing actors are brilliant they're just they they deserve half of playing the role they're amazing. Wow. What an interesting experience. Uh, I mean, learning your lines in such a way that nothing, so you had to know your lines cold, just your lines, because you're not I didn't being. I not understand what he was saying. Yeah, you don't know what the other person is saying, so it doesn't remind so I had to watch him. I really to had to watch him. Like, yeah. I know what he's thinking, but I really have to watch him. That's yeah. great. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Great. Yeah, this is this is excellent. Like I said, I'm really really enjoying this. And um, so yeah, uh, well, um, and I, I one question that I personally had, um, 
they did shoot it mostly in sequence on take, I believe I've heard, but I don't know if that's true or not. And I just wanted to confirm if it. I don't know. Did you hear that, Jim? Yeah, you might I, know. He was saying, did we shoot in sequence? No, or no. mostly in sequence? Oh, oh, yes, 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 sir. They did, um, they did the last scene at the end. Yeah, oh, right. <laughs> That's but I don't think we shot know, ours in sequence, sequence did we? Very there, much were, there were things, but it wasn't entirely. It wasn't entirely in sequence. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I've heard that they had shot in sequence, but then I got a hold of the uh, production schedule, uh, a couple of pages of it anyway, and the first page says that you guys are uh, actually. Uh, it's when um, Her Hermes' mother is yelling out the door for him, and that was one of the first scenes, according to what I read on the production schedule. Of course, those things do get changed, but uh, and it was July twenty eighth, nineteen seventy, is the date that I have wow. <laughs> on the. Uh, <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and September fourteenth, nineteen seventy was the uh, was the end date, from what I have. I think they. I, in my memory is that they tried to shoot in sequence as much as possible. Okay, I was just I was just curious. Yeah, and just as a side note, and this is kind of funny. I, I was born August first, nineteen seventy, so this was literally a week into the shooting. <laughs> Oh, there he goes bragging again about being not young. bragging. Oh, just right. it's just funny that this all happened at the same time. I was brought kicking and screaming into this world when you guys were making this wonderful <laughs> film. Yeah. So uh, Maureen, but, you know, Maureen Stapleton was uh, the voice right. of Hermes' mom. Yes, Mem mm -hmm. memorably so. Yes. If I'm not mistaken, she wasn't Kathy's mom, was she? Or was yes, she? yes, she is. Yes, yes. Kathy Allen Tuck, who played. Yeah. Uh, Hermes right. girlfriend. Yes. Yeah, that's her mother. Yes. Yeah. That's correct. That's awesome. Wow. Yes. Yeah. That is that is very, very true. Good, good, uh, good, good for pointing that out. Yeah, I'm so sorry, Christopher didn't that didn't work out with uh Christopher who played Miriam, my girlfriend in the, <laughs> in the movie. That yeah, she, she was supposed to be here and it didn't seem to work out. Yeah, she was having trouble getting. She said the invite was invalid, and I kept sending her uh, invites, and it's, she's having trouble. I don't know. So uh, she said to give everybody her love and and to tell you all. She said hello. I don't know exactly what was happening, oh, and so I hate I hate girl. that happened. But yeah. Uh, but yeah. So and what? Tell me what movie could anybody buy feeling up a girl's shoulder? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Making it hot. <laughs> that's right you're actually blushing <laughs> <laughs> you know it the just going back to the right. story that i went up there five years ago what was so amazing about that is the how everything was conflated in the sense that not only was was i feeling this incredible nostalgia about us doing the movie 45 years ago but it's all enhanced by the nostalgia of the movie itself that it creates. Because yeah. I know the movie so well over all these years. And looking at it just felt like you could step right back into the time that we were there. Mm. It was just everything yeah. was right there. You know, uh, it was it was it was very yeah, it was, it's funny because I've always said a couple of things over the years that women, when, when I go into a room with a bunch of people, I always go to the women. I love women. I do women's conferences. I write a lot of books for women and all So do I. And so, <laughs> yeah, so, so they, there's no jealousy. Women would come up with me with their husband standing right there constantly and saying to me, my husband is in love with you. <laughs> and then after the appropriate amount of years went by, now they come up and say, my husband was in love with you, and so is my son. <laughs> <laughs> because they keep playing this movie. Yeah. And it just has legs. It has legs. It's never, it's never gotten corny or old or um, dated. Right. Well, you know, it, it followed, it also followed a, um, along the lines of, you know, what came later on that that is exactly opposite of what our movie was were movies like Porky's, if you remember. Oh, yes. Porky's. 
And it was always about these, basically there were three main characters. There was the, the one guy who was kind of the sensitive one. He had one friend that was really brash and one friend that was fairly innocent. And though that's what that was totally the setup, except those were done on the side where there was nudity. It was, it was, you know, our movie, I think what's given it the legs is the, you know, just the honesty behind it and the, yes. the sensitivity that, and it was just all very real. I remember people just talking about that over the years, yes. just about how real it is and how people could relate. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's cool. It's very tastefully done. I've always said that's, that's the, um, that's what makes it so special is it's so it's so artfully and tastefully done, I think. And yeah. so that makes it all that makes all the difference in the world. And uh, so um, but anyway, uh, if you, you guys know, want. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, after all these years, what's so wonderful after having, you know, our careers that we've all had in in whatever we've done to have something that 50 years later to be part of something that people remember and yeah. kind of revere and 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 with uh, people people write me uh, it's just yeah it's it's extraordinary yeah it's it's like it really feels like a privilege to have been a part of the the movie because I was only you know for me I mean it's centered I mean you are it Jennifer anybody that talks to me about the movie talks about yeah. you they talk about us. And and oh, and you guys were very funny this and that, but you were the obviously the the center. Me and the music. The music. <laughs> You're far too far too humble, um, you know. But to this many years later, it it's it's just it's a privilege to be part of something that's remembered. I always joke around saying, you know, nobody comes up to me to say, oh, I loved you and Barnaby Jones. Oh my gosh, it changed my life. You know, I mean, you know, you do you you work throughout your career and do a lot of things, but to have something that's remembered yeah. is Definitely. really special. You know, yeah, yeah people well, that's very fortunate. Yes, people were really excited when I was trying to. I told them I was trying to assemble this and make it happen, and I got a lot of excitement uh, about it, which pleased me because I, I just like I said, it holds such a special place in my heart and and all of that. So, um, but anyway, we'll we will move on to your post summer of 42 years, if you want to talk a little bit about where your life's journey has taken you in the intervening years, uh, we would love to, to hear about all that. All right. You want to start again, Oliver? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, um, I, I, had a, I had a career uh, going as, <clears throat> as a young actor uh, following the film and, and was on Broadway. Uh, for enough time to make me understand acting as a kind of job, you know, um, and um, and then there was the sequel, and and uh, and then I didn't have the I don't know the concentration or the strength of will, and I had this idea that I was going to succeed as myself and not. Uh, pretending to be someone else, uh, which I now think of as very foolish, uh, because that's not that's that's a misguided understanding of acting. Um, and I and I did uh, I, I was I was in ac I was an academic for for a while, uh, for quite a while, uh, and then I chucked it um, and and started acting again in two thousand. Um, uh, I, I was. I, I played Ham in Beckett's um, uh, play uh, Endgame, and that's that's <laughs> that's a way to get back into acting. Uh, <laughs> the, latest, the latest thing I'm doing is is a, a, a some direction, uh, so that the hope I had way back when I was 14 is actually going to come come true. I'm I'm adapting a um, a Shepherd play for 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 a, a film treatment um, in New Mexico. Uh, this summer, cool, outstanding, That's exciting. Yeah, with a friend who has been working on a one-man show since forever. Dan Burkharth is his name, and we're going to combine it with this shepherd piece called "Kicking a Dead Horse." How great! Yes. And, and, and film in in you know in the in those um, Breaking Bad landscapes. Um, there you go. Yeah. 
So, and I've been doing a lot of acting. Uh, of course, this last year has meant that I've been doing a lot of Zoom acting. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Right. I've mastered the art of staying home. <laughs> yes. Is what um, I the, the movie. I mean, it started. It started my career, you know, uh, back then, and I was fortunate enough over the years to um, to continue acting for a lot of years and have a few things that I mean, I did a lot of TV. Did had a chance to do with this movie with Paul Newman called Slapshot about hockey that uh, that people remember. And then I then uh, later on I stumbled into um, the show The Brady Bunch where they. Years later, they got together again, and the the girls in the Brady Bunch got married, and I married Marcia, and uh, and, and it just kept returning. You know, we did uh, we did a TV movie that was like the highest rated movie of the year, the reunion movie of uh, of the Brady Bunch, and then we did a TV series, and then we did another movie about six years later, and then that was really successful. So we then did another series that was an hour long dramatic series of the called the Brady's. So um, that certainly went on and on. And um, then I sort of transitioned over into um, doing a voiceover work, which I was really fortunate to, you know, do, be really active in that for many, many years. Still doing that now and producing a lot of advertising uh, and, you know, just really grateful. You know, I find myself really grateful now. Yeah. You know, it's I'm not working as much at all, and it's okay. You know, it's the way it's the way the business works, and yeah. you know, it's not a matter of feeling embittered or feeling anything. It's like, wow, I had my time. How cool that I yeah. even had a chance to have my time, yeah. and in the midst of it, do something like this. That this many years later, it's remembered. So. You know, it's been good. It's been good. My turn. Your yes. turn. <laughs> you're the you're the most dynamic of us all because you. I don't know about that. I'm, I'm sure, uh, certainly the crazier one. Well, especially what you're doing all now. All you know. of us. Uh, I remember when I was asked to write my autobiography, which I thought about long and hard. Uh, it's appropriately titled "Surviving Myself." Uh -huh. And uh, I thought it's not going to be a finger pointing mission. Uh, you throw dirt, you lose ground. That's not what it was about. Uh, I had come to my faith in Jesus Christ when I was 38 years old in LA, at which point shortly thereafter, I moved to Nashville. And, um, and I wrote that book. And um, that was an interesting move as far as career goes, because you move out of town, you're out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. Um, still, I've managed to do about 38, 40 movies and uh, write. Well, that's that's like, all just 38 or <laughs> like, 40. But, oh, my God. But, it, but it's interesting because my my interest shifts shifted and I came to Nashville. So when I wrote uh, Surviving Myself, you all know that when you're in the industry, there is a, sort of a caveat. You have your uh, entree to other people in the industry, even if you don't know them. They know you, 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 you try and remember whether you saw them in a award thing or something. So I wrote Surviving Myself and I sent it to Elizabeth Taylor to read. I don't think I ever had met her, but, but she read it and she called me in Nashville and she said, Jennifer, we have a lot in common. We didn't date men, we married everyone and we're both hard to kill. So all I know is that she heard about uh, Jesus in my book. Um, and th those are a lot of the questions about Summer 42 as well, because of that, we, we touched on that before. Um, so I did a lot, I've, I've done many, many movies while I'm here. I'm about to do the Ronald Reagan movie, a little piece in that. Um, I have a script that I sent you, Mr. Jerry. Um, Got it is the, the back, it, it, I live on a farm 20 minutes outside of Nashville. And so I always had my horses and God kind of recycled my dreams. I'm still writing, doing women's conferences, doing films and all of that. But for the last 11 years, um, I, my husband and I have used the farm um, for equine assisted therapy for our military for first responders and their families. 
and it's all free of charge. And we've served over 4,000 of the of our heroes um, yeah. in that in that realm. So that's the backdrop of this next movie I'm going to do here. And I have to laugh because my husband and I have been married 24 years. I don't know how I fit it in with everybody else, but that's <laughs> just awesome. But um, he said I had to come to Nashville to find him. So, uh, so I'm here at the farm and we have now a studio. I feel like I have the back lot of 20th Century Fox because of 20, uh, 20 and so forth. He, my husband is a unbelievable engineer and owned Douglas Corner Cafe, which is like the Bluebird in Nashville for 33 years and had to just close it uh, mm -hmm. because of COVID. So he has his ugly truck lean here. Um, that's a, a tractor trailer studio that's extraordinary that he started out on the road with the stones and everyone else as an engineer and then didn't want to travel so much. So he put it behind his club, uh, Douglas Corner Cafe. So now it's here. So we're going to be doing music. We're going to be doing streaming. We're going to be doing films. Uh, we're going to be helping the veterans. We're opening up the farm to help the people that are really dealing with a lot of stress from COVID and all of that. So it's not just our, our Very hero. Interesting. Girl, happy girl. Very interesting. Yes. Come and see us. Mm. Look, I want you, I, I don't know if you can see this, but this is my brochure. You see my little donkey painted? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Can you see that? Yeah, come and visit us. That's wonderful. Boy. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm humbled. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, I get up every morning and I'm, as I say, 73 years old and people are saying, what, what, what are you doing? And I said, I, I just don't want to run out of time. I just, I just feel like there's a lot to do. Um, it's a very interesting time to live. Uh, being sequestered changes um, your tapestry in a way. So it's going through it, what everybody's going through, which is a, a shift. Uh, as far as the business goes, trying to figure out, we were supposed to do my movie on the Hill last year and COVID hit, um, but I hope that we'll be able to do it. Um, it's a great piece and um, you can reach a lot of people, but it's trying to figure out the shape of what this industry is right now, because we can probably in different fashion than I'm used to reach more people than ever. With yeah, Jennifer, have you have you watched a Canadian series? I think it's on Netflix called. Which one? Uh, it's a Canadian series no. about families who have horses. Um, they all seem to have emerged from rodeo, uh, but but they end up with uh, dude ranches or or uh, jumping and and uh, uh, stables. Uh, Canadian. Right. It's called Heartland. I think it's very good. Heartland. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that one. I, I, um, I love horses. They have 17 expressions horses do. People don't know this. They, they are absolute magical horses because they're, they're prey animals. They're not like a dog where you come in the room and unless they've been abused and just wag their tail. They, they check you out, they assess you and it's all about trust and relationship and the things that so much we're missing, especially working with our heroes, our warriors that suffer from PTSD, they, they uh, sacrifice and their entire family so much for us that I'm, I'm just honored to work with them. And the horses, I, I bred them for 40 years, showed them in the A circuit and all of that. And now to, as I said, God recycled my passion to be able to share them with other people that have never gotten their fingers in the fur is just fabulous. Mm -hmm. that must, yeah, that must be wonderful. Yes. How, how cool that you get to do something you love so much now. It, it's 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 a it's a gift. I mean, I'm just really really blessed to be able to do that to to get in that round pen because I'm I'm English, so I didn't have a round pen. But uh, to be able to work with these people and see lives change uh, in in short order, um, we have a lady here named Miss Franklin, and I'm allowed to say her name because she told me I could. Uh, but when she first came here, I couldn't touch her. I couldn't get near her. She wouldn't get out of bed. Mm -hmm. uh, and they called me from the, the VA or from, she's from um, Operation Stand Down. And um, 
Third time she was here, she was working the horses, hugging everybody, come, takes the bus. You can't wow. wait to get here. And uh, that makes my life sing. Very nice. Very nice. I want to, I want to, I just want to chime in because we were talking sort of professionally about what went on, but I have, I have an amazing wife and two wonderful boys, three actually, you know, I have a stepson oh, yeah. and, yes. and they're, well, they're very about your wife. I'm a grandmother of a 25, six year old, 24 year old and a 22 year old and an 18 year old. And my daughter is 52 and my sons are 40 and 34. Wow. wow. So there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got me beat again. Families over to the farm and really make this fun. Oh, this well, wonderful. I, yes. I have two boys. Uh, one is one is 27, one is 31, incredibly. And they're both um, reasonable human beings, uh, it would seem. Um, so I'm happy about that. Great. Which is quite frankly, a great thing to be able to say that your kids are reasonable human beings. Seriously. Yes. Yeah. That's nice. Given, given I'm, how... I'm, I'm, I'm totally missing what you're saying, Oliver. Well, I'm sorry. I, I just, but, um, it's, I was compelling about I'm my- enjoy, I'm enjoying your face so much. <laughs> <laughs> so effusive. <laughs> I, I was just compelling about my sons. Uh, oh, great. One of As them, you should. <laughs> one of them is, has just, there was a, an article in Forbes about the company he started um, and just astonishing sums. It's FinTech. I don't understand any of it. Uh, the other is uh, a um, every inch a musician and is in Brussels studying Baroque guitar. Wow. Nice. That's yes. great. <laughs> I envy anybody with the talent to do that. <laughs> For sure. Yes. Well, Adam, I, I just want to thank you for putting this together. Adam, it was splendid. And thank you. Yes. Well, it's my pleasure, really. Uh, you know, and I'm, I appreciate you guys agreeing to it. I know it's it's you guys have lives and you, you really have better things to do than to jaw on about <laughs> these no, things. But fun. I really enjoy it. <laughs> but I no. really appreciate it. And you even <laughs> let me pass uh, when I mispronounced uh, <laughs> Mendocino a while ago, so I <laughs> give me a pass on that. And it's I didn't intend right. that. I was, I was, I was a little nervous because I wanted to do this, do you guys proud, as they say. So I was. Well, and you, you certainly do. And keeping, you know, I appreciate you keeping the the awareness of the movie alive. You know, it's yeah. uh, it's certainly so special to all of us. And for you to to be that interested in it, and 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 you know, keeping it alive like that is great. Thank you. Oh, it's like I said, my pleasure. And I had spoken, you know, I did a one-on-one -on -one interview with Herman uh, about uh, Herman Rauscher, the, the screenwriter, of course, about mm, four years ago. And, uh, you know, that was kind of the the impetus for putting this together because that went very well. And and he was delighted that, you know, I was uh, so interested in the film. And I, and I saw we were coming up on a 50th. And I said, you know, there are no documentaries about the making of this film. There are no commentaries. And yeah. we need some sort of record uh, for future generations. And so that's what this was all about. So I, I hope I've done some sort of, uh, I, I hope I've done a fair enough job in doing that and getting you all together. You, you have succeeded. Yeah. And now, again, I, much, yeah, again, I'm sorry that Christopher couldn't get on here and, and I'm sorry that Gary didn't want to. So <laughs> but, I am too, but it wasn't for lack of trying. I can tell I you that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I tried and I tried. Well, listen, uh, thank you so much for all of you for your contributions to my life. Uh, you know, this movie does mean so much to me, uh, really always has since the first time I saw it about 35 years ago. And so, you know, it just it just means the world to me and your performances and your work and you just all mean so much to me. And so I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your contributions to my life. Thank you, Adam. My pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.